Hello and welcome to this new video. In this video, I'm going to start chapter four about differentiable functions. There will be two sections in this chapter, the mean value theorem and related results, and the second section about Taylor's formulas. Okay. Now, let us revisit the notion of local maximum and local minimum. If you have a function defined on some subset of R into R, and we have a point in I, x0, we say that f has a local maximum at the point x0 if, locally, if around x0, f of x0 is the biggest value of f. So f of x is less or equal to f of x0 for all x in some neighborhood of x0. And we have a similar definition for local minimum. Okay. Now, the first uh, result is actually if you have a function defined on some interval a, b, some int open interval a, b into R, and suppose that it's differentiable. If f has a local maximum or local minimum at the point x0, then necessarily the derivative vanishes at x0. So, geometrically, this means that uh, at the point x0, there is a horizontal tangent to the graph. Now, this is not difficult actually to prove just by going back to the definition of derivative. So, you just write f of x plus h or f of x0 plus h minus f of x0 over h is positive or negative according to the sign of h. And therefore, when you let h tend to 0, you get a double inequality it should be from the one hand less or equal than zero, from the second hand bigger or equal than zero. So it must be equal to zero. Okay. Now, the first result of this uh, video is called is known as Rolle's theorem. <coughs> if you have a function defined on a compact interval a b, which is continuous on a b differentiable on the open set AB and having the same values at the end points, so f of A equal f of B. Then f prime must vanish inside the interval at some point. Okay, this is a consequence of the previous lemma, actually. So we distinguish between two cases, f constant and f not constant. If f is constant, there's nothing to prove, because if f is constant, then the derivative is zero, so any point c would do. So we assume that f is not constant. So what does it mean that f is not constant on the interval a, b? It means that there is at least one point inside a, b, x0, such that f of x0 is different from f of a. So... We may assume that f of x0 is bigger than, so or we can distinguish between two cases if you like. So if suppose that f of x0 is bigger than f of a. Now, since f is continuous on the compact interval a, b, it must achieve a maximum value at some point c in the compact set a, b. Okay? But now, actually... So C cannot be in, so cannot be equal to A and B because F of C, since it's a maximum value, it should be bigger at least F of X0. But F X0 is strictly bigger than F of A, so C cannot be equal to A. And since F of A equal F of B, so also for the same reason, C cannot be equal to B. So C must be strictly inside. So what we have here, we have a maximum inside the interval. And by the lemma, f prime must vanish at this point, right? Now, if f of x0 is less than f of a, then it's completely symmetric, actually. Then f has a minimum value, and for the same reason, c is strictly inside. So it's important to, if you want to apply the previous lemma, c must be inside the interval, okay? And not just c equal a or c equal b. So, if f of x0 is less than f of a, the situation is completely similar. So, we get, once again, f prime of c is 0. And the geometric interpretation of this theorem is that 
if we have a function satisfying the above conditions, so it's continuous on the closed interval AB and differentiable inside, and f of a equal to f of b, then there is at least one point on the graph where the tangent is horizontal. Okay? You can draw a picture if you like. Okay, so this concludes the first result of this chapter. Now, second result is known as the mean value theorem. Uh, okay, so if you, same, same assumption, but so we have a continuous function on the closed interval AB, which is differentiable inside AB. Then there exists a C, a point C inside the open interval AB, such that f of B minus f of A is equal to f of f prime of C times, this is times here, sorry for the error, so f prime C times B minus A. I'm sure that you encountered this before. I don't know if you proved it, but this, this is the proof. This is just a consequence of the previous theorem when we apply it to a special function, g of x, which is f of x minus a constant l times x minus a, where l is just the ratio f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay, So g is just a linear perturbation of f of x. Now, you may check that actually, what is g of a? g of a is just f of a because this vanishes. And g of b is also equal to f of a, right? Just replace, okay? Because you, you get b minus a over b minus a, they cancel, so it's just f of b minus f of b minus f of a, so it's just f of a, okay? So now we are, we have the conditions of Rolle's theorem applied to g, so we can apply Rolle's theorem to g, not to f. And so by Rolle's theorem, g prime vanishes at some point c, but what is g prime? g prime is just f prime minus l. So this means that f prime of c is equal to l. So f prime of c is the ratio f of b minus f of a over b minus a, and that's it. So there's an error here, this is times, not equal. Okay. And what is the geometric interpretation that you have in your book, actually? It means that under the above conditions on F, there is a point on the graph where the tangent is parallel, is parallel to the chord or the straight line joining A F of A to B F of B. Okay, this is a fundamental result in analysis actually. And one of the applications of this is what we call the mean value inequality. If you have a differentiable function on an open interval whose derivative is bounded by some constant, then for every x, y in the interval, on the domain of definition of f, we can write f of x minus f of y less than m times x minus y. This is really fundamental. It's fundamental inequality. So, but this assumes that f prime is bounded. <clears throat> and by the way, a function satisfying this inequality has a name. It's called Lipschitz continuous. It's stronger than continuous because it implies uniform continuity, actually. Because if this is if x minus y is if you if you give me epsilon, I I take delta to be epsilon over m. Then if x minus y is less than epsilon over m, then this quantity is less than epsilon, and so this is less than epsilon. So in particular, a function whose bounded derivative actually is Lipschitz continuous and therefore uniformly continuous and therefore of course continuous. You know that. <coughs> So this is one way of checking uniform continuity, if you like. Okay, so it's really fundamental. Now, a more general version of the mean value theorem is given by the following. So if you have two functions defined on the compact interval AB, which are continuous and differentiable inside, so we don't need really differentiability at the endpoints. If G prime does not vanish on the open interval AB, then f of b minus f of a over gb minus g of a is actually the ratio of the derivatives at some point c. This is actually a generalization of the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem is a particular case of this. When we just take g, g of x equal x. If g of x equal x, this is just b minus a, and this is just 1. So we get the mean value theorem. 
Okay, but this is more general because you are combining two functions. And note that this cannot this theorem cannot be obtained by as a consequence, cannot prove it by the mean value theorem. Because if you apply the mean value to theorem to the numerator, you'll get a prime of c times b minus a. And when you apply it to the denominator, you get g prime of another, maybe c2 times b minus a. So there's no guarantee that c1 that c equals c2. So this is why we have to go back to the proof. And the proof is similar. So I apply Rolle's theorem, actually, to this function. Okay, so just a similar construction, actually. Instead of f of b minus f of a over b minus a and x minus a, I just replace b by g of b and a by g of a. So, but it's the same construction, actually. So it's just a linear perturbation of uh, f of x. Not a linear, just a perturbation by g of x. So now, if you call this function phi, then, or phi, then phi is continuous on the closed interval AB and differentiable inside and have the same value. So when you put x equal a, you just get f of a minus f of a, so it's zero. And when you put x equal b, you get also zero. So we can apply Rolle's theorem, and that's it. If you apply Rolle's theorem, you get the result. So same thing. Okay? Now, this is known also as Cauchy's theorem. And the consequence of this is the famous L'Hopital rule. Okay. L'Hopital rule, as you may know, okay, says the following. If we have an open inter a function, or two functions, actually, defined on an open interval i containing a point x0, such that f of x0 equal to g of x0 equals 0. Okay, and G prime does not vanish for X different from X0. So X0 is the only root or the only zero of G on this interval. Then if F prime over G prime has the limit L, then F over G has, as X tends to X0, then F of G has the same limit. So in practice, we write limit of F of X. Okay, so first we have to there's a condition. We have to have something of the form 0 over 0. When we, have, when we try to compute the limit, we should have something of the form 0 over 0. And so it's unde undetermined. So one way is to solve this is to try the ratio of the numerator over the ratio of the So derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. Okay, so... In practice, we write limit of f of x over g of x is limit of f prime over g prime. So we must, we must have something of the form 0 over 0. Okay? Now, this is really a consequence. Why this is so? This is a consequence, of course, the previous theorem, actually. So I just apply the previous theorem to the functions f and g. Okay? So I apply it to the interval x0, x, or x, x0. It depends where, actually... Uh, if x is bigger or uh, less than x0, doesn't really matter. But so if I apply Cauchy's theorem, I get f of x minus f of x0 over g of x minus g of x0 equal to the ratio evaluated at some point cx between x and x0. Okay? I don't really care about the order here because I can write also f of x0 minus f of x over g of x0 minus g of x. So it's exactly the same thing. And now, if the if this has a limit, then this has a limit because as x tends to x zero, c x also tends to x zero, and and that's it. And now, of course, f of x zero is is g of x zero equals zero. So just I first simplify, so I get f over g is f prime over g prime, and when x tends to x zero, if this has a limit l, then this has a limit l, the same limit actually, and that's it. Now, remark, the first remark, actually, we don't need also to have something 0 over 0. I can have infinity over infinity because I can do a change of variables. I can have infinity over infinity, or I can, the, the point x0 where I'm taking the limit could be also plus infinity. It's not a big deal, actually, because I can do a change of variables. So we can also, we can apply L'Hopital rule if the point is taken to be plus or minus infinity, or if I have an undeterminate uh, ratio of the form infinity plus over infinity, 
Yeah, not, not just zero over zero, but it must be undetermined. Okay? And we may apply L'Hopital rule several times if you like. So in practice, uh, yeah, this is F double prime actually. So F double prime over G double prime. So here's an example. Okay, for example, suppose that you want to evaluate the limit of x minus sine x over x cubed as x tends to zero. If you try to evaluate the numerator, you get zero over zero, so it's undetermined. Okay, everything is differentiable here, there's no problem. So I look at the, the, the ratio of the derivatives. So the derivative of x minus sine x is 1 minus cosine x, and the derivative of the denominator is 3x squared. So it gives me the limit of this. But once again, this is undetermined because it's of the form 0 over 0. So I differentiate another time, and I get sine x over 6x. Now, you may know that sine x over x tends to 1. If you don't know that, you just can just uh, differentiate another time and get cosine x over 6. So the limit is 1 over 6. Okay, so this is uh, what we do in practice. Okay, but this is f double prime over g double prime. Okay. And that's it. So this concludes this video about section 4.1. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk about several forms of Taylor's formula. So there are three types or three ways, three uh, uh, forms of Taylor's formula uh, which, that we shall explore in details in the next video. So thank you for your attention and see you next time.